Welcome to the Boneyard with Steve Robertson. As always, I am your good friend and host, Steve Robertson, here on the Hump Day edition of The Yard. How are you today? You doing good? I'm doing good. Happy. Yesterday was great. Cooler temperatures. Kind of that, uh, the false fall. I mean, who are we kidding ourselves? It's August, right? I mean, you know, we still got a bunch of uh, humidity and heat to deal with. But uh, great day yesterday. Nice to get up and walk outside and uh, take the dogs out and get a little uh, chill on the skin. Kind of reminding us that, um, you know, those five days of fall are going to be great. It's always uh, interesting how that works. But uh, right now it's a cool, crisp 67 in the greater Starkville area. A high today of uh, 84. We're going to get back into the high 90s uh, late next week. So uh, enjoy it while you can, kids, for sure. And the feels like temperature is 69 degrees. Nice. Nice. But uh, nevertheless, it was uh, it's good to be out on football practice yesterday. And uh, Wednesday is a day off uh, for your team. And then Thursday and Friday will wrap up the final uh, media viewing sessions of practice. And next thing you know, we'll be in mock week, as we call it. And then it'll be game week. Almost there, kids. All most there. Exciting times for sure. We're going to talk some football today, talk a lot of football today. I have been inundated with messages and tweets and texts and calls and saying, hey, Steve, you need to dig into this blindside thing, write another book. I've got no interest in writing another book at this point. You know, the new book will be out uh, uh, next month. You know, as a matter of fact, it's been sent to lay out and go on the print. If you hadn't done so, go to whenthebottomfalls.com and you can pre-order the new book. While you're there, you can get all my sports books too. So whenthebottomfalls.com, you can get Flim Flam, Alpha Dogs, Stark Villains, Flim Flam, all that good stuff. But a lot of people are like, hey, Steve, you need to be the guy to dig into this. And that would probably be the worst case scenario for those involved in all that. But uh, no, I have no interest in that. But we are going to talk about it some today. Uh, We are going to touch on that topic. Matter of fact, our top 10 list is centered around the blind side. How about that? You weren't expecting that today, but you're going to get that today. Uh, A couple things on that list I think are rather interesting. But uh, yeah, you'll get my thoughts on on that topic today. Of course, we'll have our Texas A&M preview. That's a Bulldog opponent. And uh, we're going to talk a lot about kind of what's going on around Mississippi State football. Got an interesting story to share with you in the uh, in the first segment of the show. And then, uh, reminder, I'm going to be hitting the road to uh, Knoxville this afternoon. I am going to bring the microphone and stuff with me, just in case I decide to uh, to record Friday morning. So, we'll see how that goes. You know, we got plans every day. Uh, Friday is uh, the uh, Knoxville Tattoo Convention, so I'm going to go to that. I've never been to a tattoo convention. I have no idea what to expect, and that's uh, kind of the beauty of life these days is getting out and doing things I've never done before because I can, and I uh, hope that you guys get a chance to do that stuff too. But, uh, yeah, get out and have some fun, man. What's life without a little whimsy? Right? Get out and go do some cool stuff. And uh, for those of you that are wondering, as of now, I'm uh, planning to get a falling in reverse tattoo um, on Friday. That's the plan. I don't know what the wife's going to get. I think that she's finally going to take the plunge and get something on her uh, lower arm, forearm, something like that. Uh, cool with me, man. You know, I'm always about expression. Do what makes you happy without hurting somebody else. It's a good way to go through life. I'm a live and let live person, man. I believe you can you can be or should be whoever you want to be as long as it's not hurting somebody else. That's how life should work. But, um, you know, I've always identified myself as a bit of an individual. And so uh, get out and go get a tattoo. You yeah, know, it's always cool. And then uh, I'll get another one in uh, November. I'll get another one sometime around Christmas. And then I don't know. We'll see what next year looks like. But, um I still got some uh, open space that I plan to fill, and uh, yeah, I'll, who knows? I may get covered up, but uh, yeah, I, I like to get out and go do things and uh, experience life. And again, I've never been to a tattoo convention; have no idea what to expect, other than the fact that I'm getting a tattoo. But we'll see how it goes. But 
yeah, I got plans. Uh, we'll do some stuff tonight, and then uh, I don't know what we're doing Thursday. I think we're going to do uh, paint with a twist Thursday night. I think that's the plan. I don't make all these plans. Uh, I know when we were in Albuquerque, we did that paint with a twist thing, and your good friend at host is not sp especially artistically inclined. We had to do a uh, deal of uh, Wednesday Adams. My wife will tell you that uh, my Wednesday Adams looks better than hers. But, uh, yeah, you get out and you're going to do some cool stuff. Get outside your comfort zone a little bit. And those are good dating ideals, right? I mean, you know, when you, you and your significant other go do something that's not old hat, right? So that's kind of the plan this week. I'm sure tonight we'll go have dinner and, uh, you know, maybe go hear some live music or something. And uh, So I won't be around the boards a lot the next couple of days if you're a Jeans Page subscriber. But uh, we've got an army of people. They're going to take care of you. Uh, Mike will be uh, on the road himself, but uh, Dave and Paul, I know, will have Thursday practice handled. Robbie uh, has some prep responsibilities on Friday Friday night. Not sure what uh, what Paul's got going on Friday night, but um, full coverage of Mississippi State football practice over at jeanspage.com, the 247 Sports uh, Mississippi State affiliate. And you may have noticed that uh, we have recently changed the logo we had the M State banner there for a long time, and uh, we have um, made the decision to use the script state now to identify Mississippi State on 247 Sports. Uh, the network very graciously agreed to uh, allow us to do that, kind of protect the brand, but also to kind of move with the times. There will be some other changes coming up in the months ahead. Uh, we'll tell you more about that later. Got... Um, I don't know, probably two weeks away from announcing uh, something else. Yeah, so you'll have to just kind of be you know, patient with that. A couple more weeks, we'll, uh, we'll have something cool and new and fresh over at jeanspage.com. And uh, if you're not a member, you should be. Nobody's going to give you better coverage of Mississippi State Athletics than we are. No matter who they are, what they try, it's not going to make any difference, right? Uh, so be prepared. Some change is coming in the months ahead. And then the next one will be uh, in about two weeks. So we'll get you, we'll get you updated and all that. And uh, something that's been in the works for a while. So just so you know. All right, let's thank our friends at Bulldog Burger Company. Uh, they're, they're making some changes from time to time too, but there is such a consistency with Bulldog Burger Company. Like your favorites are always going to be on the menu, but there's always some chef specials and there's events, there's the tap takeovers, there's live music at the Tupelo venue. There's always a little something different, right? So if you're looking for a date night location, perhaps consider Bulldog Burger Company. You can have an adult beverage there. You can order your significant other a glass of wine. You can have a uh, adult beverage yourself. Maybe it's a night out with family. Maybe you don't want to drink from your kids. I don't know. I'm not judging. But maybe you decide, you know what, we're just going to go have a good family night and uh, we're all going to get a chocolate shake to go because that's what we do. We're about that life. Uh, be sure and go check them out. One of their three great locations, University Drive here in Star Vegas, Gloucester Street in Tupelo, Lake Harbor Drive in the Ridge and Flowood area. Have a great restaurant quality hamburger. Uh, maybe you say, you know what, Steve, I want to eat a little healthier these days. Get that BLT salad grilled. You will not leave disappointed. You'll leave some food because you're not going to be able to finish it because the portion is so substantial. And get the spring rolls as your appetizer. I mean, that's one of the main reasons you go, right? We talk about self-care all the time, right? That hokum, right? Uh, but this is the real self-care here because it makes you better looking. Yeah, it's in writing. Go check them out uh, as best you can, as soon as you can. Bulldog Burger Company, a place for people to go to meet. M-E-A-T. All right. I went over to Campus Bookmark yesterday uh, for the, uh, the official unveiling of the Vintage Vault logo. No surprise. It's the interlocking MSU not the MS backwards J that we grew up with in the early 80s and late 70s, uh, but uh, the probably, I would venture to say, the best football logo we've ever had. And some of that maybe because we equate that logo with success, right? And that happens, right? Uh, I have never been a fan of the white helmets. I think, uh, you know, the white helmets with maroon jerseys looks terrible. I'm, I'm just going to say it for what it is. It looks terrible. It does. And uh, I don't know who decided that. Hey, let's do this. No, it, it looks bad. Nobody ever embraced that. 
I mean, sometimes we like change for the sake of change, but the white helmets with the M State banner, I think, is one of the most unattractive looks we've ever had. The quote Nike MSU interlocking, I think, is the best we've ever had. And uh, I want to give you a little background here. So for years and years and years and years and years, we were told we couldn't use that logo again because of the fact that it was owned by Nike. And we all just accepted it as fact. And maybe there was some contractual agreements in place that we are unaware of. Let's just go ahead and put that on the table. Maybe there's things we don't know. Maybe. It's unlikely, but maybe. We'll have that caveat, right? And so last year, this is last spring, it began to kind of bubble up about the MSU interlocking, quote, Nike emblem. There was a lot of discussion over Gene's page, but hey, we need to do this. We can't use it. It's owned by Nike. So I said, you know what? I want to, I want to dig into this and see if it's true. I've, I, I hold a patent too, right? I own the Stark villain patent and trademark. It's true. I don't know what it gets me, but I didn't want somebody else to go out and print some shirts with Stark Villain on them and then uh, you know, take my idea and my phrasing. And so I put a copyright on it. And so I have a copyright attorney who listens to this show. And um, as the discussion about the, they're calling it the 98 logo, but it's the interlocking MSU. As that discussion began to kind of gain some steam, again, I dug into this and and uh, spoke with him, and we found out that that logo was available for purchase. Like, the the patent had expired. The licensing agreement had expired. We said, you know what? we got to go look into this. And so I have him go pull the paperwork, and um, we're like, well, what, what do we do? You know, we did not want to go buy the mark and then sell merchandise that Mississippi State did not profit in. That's the wrong thing to do, right? I mean, I I trade in Mississippi State sports, right? It had been great for us to have it, you know, and maybe uh, make that the official logo over a jeans page or whatever, you know. But the more that I thought about it, the more concerned I got about that. I said, what if, you know, some third-party vendor, some out-of-state or out-of-the-country merchandising operation bought this logo and then they begin to sell Mississippi State merchandise with a formerly official brand or mark of the university, that would be unfortunate. And then I got to think, well, how could this ever be? How could this logo be available for purchase? And so uh, I made a phone call and um, you called a couple people and uh, even reached out to John Cole, and I was like, you know, John, I don't know if you know about this, but this has uh, not been taken care of. And at the end of the day, what we find out, I'm not going to name any names. I'm not here to shame anybody. And there are going to be people that hear this, and immediately they're going to say, I can't believe it. Relax, okay, relax. People are people, and people are human. People make mistakes. But there was somebody, of course, that was charged with this on an annual basis. Like it fell under their purview of their job responsibilities, and this particular person left the university and didn't take care of this. And there should have been some follow-up, obviously. Uh, there was a department head, obviously, that was in, in, involved and probably should have followed up. But, uh, you know, things get busy, whatever. And again, I'm not here to shame anybody. And so I called John, and I'm like, hey, John, are you aware of this? So he begins to dig into it. He goes, hey, let me call you back. So John makes some phone calls. Before I could hear even hear back from John, I've got multiple people within the Mississippi State family, they're calling me. Uh, One person in particular wanted to argue with me about it, and uh, apparently when John called them, he had a little bass in his voice. And apparently they thought that I was just kind of picking at a wound here that was unnecessary. And so I tried to explain to him, I said, no, I have a trademark attorney. We can go buy this right now. And they're like, no, you can't. No, you can't. No, you can't. And they said, and even if you did, we could litigate that. And I'm like, well, hang on a minute here, right? Nobody's litigating anything. And why would you want to go through that trouble when you could just go, you know, renew the license, right? 
Just file some paperwork through the legal office, pay a fee, and you're done. Why would you want to do that? But that's kind of how life works, right? I mean, when something happens unexpected, you know, we kind of go into self-defense mode. It's like, wait, no, 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 no. So I got three or four phone calls from different people that day, and uh, eventually talked to John again, and uh, they felt like they had it handled. And to be honest with you, we were not, we were not fully um, convinced that some of the people involved in the process had it handled. We were prepared uh, between me and my trademark attorney, who was also a Mississippi State uh, alum, or well, I'm not an alum, he is. We're both Mississippi State Bulldogs. But uh, we were prepared to go ahead and file the necessary paperwork to secure the trademark and then gift it back to the university. That's not our job to do that. But at the same time, too, we wanted to protect that image that means so much to all of us because we do equate it to, the, you know, in many respects, the glory days of Mississippi State football. I mean, we, we won the SEC West in 1998, and this year, of course, is the 25-year anniversary of that, that magical season. And so eventually I talked to a few people, and they're like, hey, hey this has been taken care of, and it was. And said, hey, we're going to give you a little information here, kind of as a favor. Hey, next year, that's our Vintage Vault logo. That's our Vintage Vault logo for next year. And uh, sure enough, it is. And so I went to Campus Bookmart yesterday. And uh, you know, part of it maybe just kind of satisfied a need in me. You know, I was like, you know what? I feel like in some ways we were somewhat responsible, you know, for some of this. I mean, obviously this was going to happen, but... Um, I felt some sense of pride about the fact that we had tried to take some steps to protect this very precious image that means so much to Mississippi State people and uh, probably helped the university maybe navigate through something that uh, you know, could have been unnecessary, right? At the end of the day, they're probably right. If somebody tried to trade on one of our marks, it probably would, be, it would have been a lawsuit and cease and desist and all that kind of stuff. But you begin to ask yourself, why put yourself through that? Why make more work for yourself, right? So, again, small thing. But I wanted to go because, number one, the logo means something to me. But also, too, I thought, you know, this is, this is something I'm kind of proud of, too, that uh, our Jeans Paid subscribers were the ones that alerted us to this. And then uh, my trademark attorney, who, uh, who will remain anonymous, he can identify himself if he chooses to, uh, said, hey, there's some validity to what they're saying. And then we were able to notify Mississippi State officials uh, because somebody somewhere dropped the ball. And that's true, right? That's as, as fair as I can say it. But we took corrective action. We got it taken care of. We secured it. And so I went to Campus Bookmart. And, man, I tell you this, it was like game day in there. It was packed. Bully was there. They had the big balloon arch. Bully, and I, I, Bully asked me if he could take a picture with me. So he listens to the Boneyard. So, uh, so to whoever is the 6'5 Bully, Thanks for saying hello, and thanks for listening to the show. Um, again, we took a picture together, and we hung out with some other people, and uh, this gentleman remained in character, for those that wonder. Even though he was hanging out with me, he never spoke a word. He signed out some things for me. Uh, but, yeah, it was great. It's wonderful. And it was great to see the smile on so many Mississippi State fans. We've all been there before. You know, you got big weekend plans. For some reason, it just didn't work out. Maybe life gets in the way. Maybe you want to head down to the casino. Maybe take some of their money. I like to do that. Well, my bookie's new and improved online casino is here to change the game for you. Dive into truly realistic casino experiences featuring the latest in slots, progressive jackpots, and live dealer action. All from the comfort of your own home. Take advantage of weekly blackjack tournaments and a brand new collection of high-end games for a chance at real cash rewards. The MyBookie Casino provides a Las Vegas experience when the action's in your hands. And the best part is you don't even have to wear pants. How cool is that? Your adventure at the MyBookie Casino begins today with a generous sign-up bonus using promo code BONEYARD. That's promo code BONEYARD to secure yourself a sweet deposit bonus. And that's not all. Because their revamp loyalty program ensures that you'll be showered with rewards, including free spends, cashback offers, and a host of exclusive VIP perks, the more you play, the more you'll win. Play anytime, anywhere with the MyBookie Casino. Again, that's promo code BONEYARD. And spaces. Which kind of leads me to the next point. 
Listen, I love the state script. I do. I think that should be our official logo of Mississippi State Athletics. That's how I feel. And a lot of people are like, Steve, I don't even care about a daggum logo. I just want them to win. I, I do too. But I also believe in branding, right? We are state. We need to embrace being state. And that kind of flies in the face of the interlocking MSU. But, Steve, if we're state, why do you want the helmet to say MSU? Well, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I think that is the most striking image we've ever had on a football helmet. And so I tweeted out yesterday, should the interlocking MSU be the full-time logo for Mississippi State football moving forward? And while it wasn't unanimous, it was a resounding yes. What's also interesting, if you go look through those, um, those tweets and responses, you get some responses from other fan bases within a Southeastern Conference say, you know what, I'm not a Mississippi State fan, but that's the best-looking football logo they've ever had. That looks so much better than what they have. Because let's be honest about this. And I'm not trying to shame anybody. Again, I love all of you. Some of you make my head hurt, but I love all of you. And there are some people involved in operations at Mississippi State that I think an awful lot of, but we don't always agree on everything. When we put that M-State uh, banner thing on the side of a helmet, to me it looks like a tie tack. You know, it doesn't, to me, match football. I think it looks great on a diploma. I think it looks amazing on letterhead. Uh, maybe it looks good on your wallet or your belt. I just don't think it looks good on a helmet. I don't think it looks good on a jersey. And that's my opinion. You may disagree, and that's completely okay. Because I know that we're all shareholders in the Mississippi State experience. But the best branding we've had football-wise has been that interlocking MSU, in my opinion. And, again, some of that's got to do with the fact that we were winning and winning big. And so there's feelings of nostalgia. But when I begin to think about what's happening with this Zach Arnett experience, and we're going to talk a little bit more about football um, you know, later in the show. Um, I guess we'll go ahead and knock some of that stuff out now. But uh, the thing that I hear from so many players is how physical camp has been. We are way more physical at this point than we were at the beginning of camp. That is the expectation of Mississippi State football. We're back out at South Farm. We didn't do that under Leach. We didn't do it under Moorhead. We did it under Dan. And you think about, you know, that great era between, you know, Jackie and, of course, Dan. We had some very tough players in the Sylvester Crew era, too. But there was a toughness associated with Mississippi State football. And everybody in this conference understood that. It was like, you know what? And as Zach Arnett said at SEC Media Days, when you play Mississippi State, you better bring a hard hat and you better bring a lunchbox because it's going to be an all-day affair. That is the reputation that we want to have. When you think about over the course of our history, and there have been some years that we've had stretches of futility. And while we may not have been the most talented teams, we were always among the toughest teams. When you played Mississippi State, you felt it going into the next game. We had that reputation. As I mentioned before, in, in the infancy of the Internet, when we had the old Access Atlanta stuff through the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, they had message boards. They were the most active message boards in the Southeastern Conference fandom. And you go over there and you'd read all the time about people saying how tough and physical Mississippi State is. And again, I, I've shared this comment with you guys before. It was, it was a South Carolina fan, if I remember serves me correct. You got to think that's been, you know, goodness, nearly 20 years ago. Um, but he says, I love playing teams the week after they play Mississippi State because the Bulldogs always bring the wood. And it's true. We beat people up. It's because we had a physical camp. But also, too, I think about we're back on the South Farm. We're about to sell out of season tickets. And we brought back one of the most loving, lovable images and logos in our entire athletics history. And so you start beginning to feel that you know, maybe all of the rivers are, and all the tributaries are all kind of flowing in the right direction here. 
not going to sit here and say we're going to win the West. I'm not going to say that. But I believe we have a really good chance to get the Zach Arnett era off on a very positive note. Going to have near unprecedented fan support on game day. And we need you to be at the games. We don't just need you to buy tickets. We need you to show up and bring a cowbell, maybe bring two, make sure the kids have one, teach them to ring responsibly. But something is happening. And maybe you feel it too. And if you were in a Mississippi State uh, merchandising shop yesterday, I'm sure you did. I'm sure you did feel it. There's about a 20-page thread on the jeanspage.com True Maroon football message board, right? 20 pages about people sharing their purchases, people asking questions, say, where can I find this? I got to get this. When is the last time that you've had uh, a discussion about, hey, where can I get the banner, the M-State banner polo? I mean, let that sink in for a second. You got fans excited about buying shirts, man. Shirts. And it dominates social media. And it causes such a ripple in Southeastern Conference football social media that other fans are even commenting on that. What more evidence do you need that we need to go back to that? And again, I respect everybody's opinions. There's some other people that say, you know what, Steve, I just don't like it. You know, I, I, listen, I get it. I understand why people are excited about it, but it's just not my thing. I think we're better off with this or with that. But the reality of it is, is, you know, I, I'm a firm believe give the people what they want. Give them what they want. You know, Zach Selman, I think, is a guy that is, is receptive you know, to the fan base. We wouldn't be having state script as our week-to-week helmet this year if he wasn't. And that's not to be critical of anybody else. You know, we've had some we had some amazing men that have been the athletic directors of Mississippi State. We've had some others that didn't accomplish a whole lot. But I, I never doubt people's intentions or their loyalty or things like that. I mean, when they're here, I believe they work hard for Mississippi State. You know, Zach Selman is doing some things uh, that really, I think, endears him to the fan base. I, I don't know what you could do football-wise as inexpensively as this, to galvanize the fan base. And again, I'm walking around yesterday at Campus Bookboard. I got Boneyard listeners coming up left and right, saying hello, talking about the show. What do you think about this? We think about that. And they're all lined up, you know, sometimes three and four deep at the counters, buying this merchandise. So again, I ask you, when is the last time in the month of August, for crying out loud, that we had people going to Campus Book Mart at noon on a work day during the week to buy Mississippi State merchandise. And say, well, you know, we had the NAFL championship. Exactly. You're making my point for me. That's the almost the same type of fervor right now you feel within this fan base. And I get chills talking about it, man. There's something special happening. So let's continue that. I know we're going to wear those helmets against Kentucky, and Kentucky's probably going to get beat by 70, right? All due respect, Wildcats, but uh, if we're bringing back the Jackie Sherrill era helmets, you're going to pay the price for that. And so it makes perfect sense to me. Whatever the licensing situation is, figure it out. Because you can't sit here and tell me Nike owns a logo that we just put on an Adidas shirt. So maybe things have changed. Again, maybe there's some things we didn't know about that before. But now that we have it and we're able to use it, let's figure it out. Whatever it takes. That's the thing I thought about before, too, is like, well, you know, maybe there is some type of, um, you know, financial component to all of this that maybe would be some type of drag. You know, and the thing that I think about is if that's true, if there's some type of fee or fine we have to pay, if they said, hey, guys, listen, we're going to do. We want to, we want to use this interlock and MSU going forward. However, it's going to be kind of expensive for us to buy this deal out, whatever it is. And, again, I don't know all the particulars. I'm sure somebody will, will message me to correct me. 
but there's a you know we, we want to have this kind of moving forward and so what we're going to do is we're going to allow you guys to pre-order jerseys and part of the you know, proceeds of those sales is going to pay this uh this fee would you do it you absolutely would and it's not just jerseys it's whatever you pre-order all this merchandise right with that logo on there that we all love so much most of us anyway the overwhelming majority of us get it done I mean, this is among the lowest hanging fruit that has ever existed for Mississippi State sports. We never knew we were going to love a logo as much as we did, but we do. And now that it's back, people are losing their minds. I bought merchandise too. They didn't have a lot of stuff that I, that I wanted yesterday because so much of it had been purchased. But I bought the wife uh, a shirt and got a, one of those cool little tumblers with that interlock and MSU over it. And uh, I'm excited to go give it to her. She's sleeping right now. She has no idea that I come bearing gifts. She should expect it because I normally do. But I, I just think to myself, when I saw the look in the eyes of those people buying merchandise yesterday, and it wasn't just people from my generation, it wasn't just millennials. Uh, there was one young man yesterday, I'd met him before, a sophomore at Mississippi State, and he's in line, got a handful of gear, got to go get him some interlock and MSU. It is just simply one of those things. It just seems it's, again, I don't know the legalities behind it all, but it seems to be so simple. And if I was a first-year athletic director at Mississippi State, I would say, you know what? Hey, I got to get this thing off on the right foot. Of course, winning is the only foot that matters, Right. But if I want to get people really hyped up, I want to get people to think, you know what? I'm a guy that brings change. I'm a guy that that is sensitive to the needs and the wants and the desires of the fan base. I'm going to get this done. What more evidence do you need? Again, just go look on social media. Just go look on a jeanspage.com message board. Just go see, talk to your local retailers and say, hey, guys, what kind of day did you have on August 15th when we allowed you guys to sell the interlocking MSU merchandise For the first time in a generation. What happened? This is what we want. It is. And again, I know there's some flying M fans. Listen, I I like all the marks that we've had. I do. They all have a place. But to me, nothing says Mississippi State football more than an interlocking MSU logo. And I'm glad to know I'm not alone. And again, it's like, Steve, we're talking, it's, you know, two weeks away from football season and we're talking about, you know, a sticker. I think it's more than that. I do. I I think it's more than that. I think there is an esprit de corps that kind of goes along with that logo. It's not just nostalgia. I think it's more of who we are. And all of a sudden you start thinking, you know what, hey, that's when Mississippi State was one of the better teams in the conference and one of the better teams in the country. You know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I think that there's, you know, a magic mojo with a logo. But I think it's one that conveys a sense of power. I think it strikes fears in the hearts of our opponents. And you walk out there with that uh, goofy white helmet on with the, you know, the Russell Athletics jersey, you know. I think that makes us look small time. You know, I say all the time, but I, I'm, I'm small town. I'm not small time. Mississippi State is not small time. And I think in, in order, in, rather than us, hey, let's just look for this and look for that, you know, let's, let's take the easier, softer way. Let's get this thing done. And it's gonna, we're going to wear it for at least one game. I don't know if we don't wear it in the Egg Bowl. We'll see. But if, the, if you found out that, hey, listen, this thing went so well, we sold so much merchandise, we made so much money, we made so many people happy that, you know what, next year we're just going to wear it in every game. Would, you, would your feelings be hurt about that? I don't think so. And we talk about you know, buy-in from former players. That's important to me. Uh, Zach Arnett has done a good job with that. Mike Leach, I thought, did a good job with that. I think Zach's making more of an effort. Maybe, you know, I know when Joe got here, Joe called all of our NFL dogs and said, hey, You guys have full use of the facilities whenever you're in town. We want you to be here. We want you to be around our program, be around our kids. And you know what? That's one of the great things Joe did. 
You go out there to practice, you see Jonathan Banks. You see Fletcher Cox. I mean, you see people out there, right? Names that you love and respect. But you want to talk about player buy-in? You want to talk about getting those uh, Jackie Shell era players on campus, on social media, repping the branding that they made famous? That's how you do it. You bring them down here, you get Kenzaki Jones to lead the dog pound rock. You get Robert Bean out there. He's an honorary captain wearing that fabulous logo. Again, it just makes too much sense, man, not to do it. And, I, and I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I know it's just a logo. But there's a part of me that's going to be a little bit heartbroken if we don't do this. I'm just going to kind of say it for what it is. I mean, I, and it's not just for me, right? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to represent Mississippi State regardless of what the logos look like. But when I see and hear and read the way that most of you feel, I mean, this should be a, a, a unifying time for us. It's like, hey, we're, we're coming back. You know, we're going to be a force in the SEC West. We got the right coach. We got an administration that's doing what they can to equip him with the things he needs to be successful. We got a fan base that's lined up behind him. It's buying, uh, you know, tickets at a rate we hadn't seen in several years. And now we're about to bring back uh, the most beloved football logo of all time. I mean, come on, guys. We need it to happen. We need it to happen. And I'm sure somebody's going to message me and say, hey, Steve, heard you on the show, but no buts. Figure it out. Figure it out. This is what Mississippi State fans, by and large, want. Give us what we want. All right, time for today's top 10 list is always brought to you by CloseWithBlair.com. At C-L-O-S-E with Blair, B-L-A-I-R. I never spell with. I don't think you need me to. Uh, but Blair Chandler is a mortgage professional. And many of you may have mortgage needs. Maybe you've got an interest in buying a home for the very first time. Maybe you've heard of me talk about now that an 18-year-old, it's legal for them to sign a mortgage document. Maybe you're willing to co-sign with them to allow them to build some adult credit. Maybe your kid's going to college and you want to buy a condo here and then be able to you know, flip it in four or five years. Real estate market in Starkville is uh, outstanding. It's definitely a seller's market. Maybe you can benefit from that, or perhaps your young person can benefit from that, right? Uh, Blair can walk you through every bit of that. This is a guy that's been in the industry 22 years. Nobody stays in any industry 20-plus years by accident. Works for Fairway Mortgage, a reputable lending institution, recently voted number one in customer satisfaction. You're entrusting your mortgage to somebody that's going to handle it with kid gloves. They're going to get things done, be your advocate with underwriting. You could do business with a lot of people, but you're probably not doing business as well as you should if you don't use Blair Chandler. Give Blair a call or text today at 601-500-2344, 601-500-2344. Uh, Blair continues to tell me. He's still hearing from you guys. Uh, you know, and, and Blair wouldn't continue to advertise with me if he didn't receive some benefit from it. I mean, it's not like I'm a charitable organization. This just got to be something that works well for both of us, and it does. And everybody wins. We get a sponsor for the show. Blair gets business from you guys, and you guys get into a mortgage. Again, that's closewithblair.com. All right, so uh, inspired by the blind side, and again, we're going to talk more about that later in the show. Um, we're doing a top 10 of blind songs. We don't have Snow Blind from Black Sabbath or from Styx on today's show. We don't. But this is a very uh, interesting list. Uh, all of the people involved play guitars. There's at least some guitar. But uh, we've got some 80s pop. we got some 70s, um, I don't know, singer-songwriter stuff. Got some 80s metal. Got some modern rock. Some classic rock, some radio rock. It's all rock, man. It's all rock all the time. So here are your top 10 blind songs in honor of the blindside situation. Number 10 
One of my favorite bands of all time, and I'll be honest with you, it's difficult for me to get behind a lot of the newer material now that Lane Staley's passed away. Now, when they reunited and they hired Howard to be the singer, and he sounds a lot like Lane Staley, he doesn't have the same range as Lane, but there's still that kind of haunting element to his vocal quality. But uh, there's a great track that fits our, our, um, our genre, our motif today. It's Allison Chains, Deaf Ears, Blind Eyes. Deaf Ears, Blind Eyes, your number 10 song from Alice in Chains. And uh, the Deaf Ears, Blind Eyes, in many respects, kind of uh, kind of typifies the people that, that took this movie and thought it was like a factual account. And we're going to get to some of that a little bit in the show, too. I keep teasing that. But um, there are a lot of people that they always want to believe the best in every situation. Uh, my wife is one of those people, too. You know, she thinks everybody's good. I think most people are rotten, uh, which is probably the wrong way to look at life. So we balance each other out. But there are a lot of people that they want to be sold a bill of goods and feel like they've made a good investment. And that's kind of where we are with this deal here. Number nine, the great uh, Christian rock band that had a lot of success on Top 40. I remember the last time we had a song from them on the show. I had multiple people tweet me and say, Steve, I forgot about how great this song was. It was Lifehouse, right? Hanging from a moment. That's not our song today, but it is Lifehouse. A great track from them. It was a single. Probably didn't get the press or the airplay that it deserved. And it's simply called Blind. Be sure and check that out. You'll be glad you did. Number eight, probably the song that got me into this band, Blackstone Cherry. I've seen them several times now. They're, they always put on a great show. It's just a great rock and roll band, right? They got a little bit of country twang, got a little bit of blues. A lot of rock. When, remember when we were all in MySpace, right? And you could put a song on your MySpace page that was kind of typified of who you were, what you were about. I remember when Chris Daughtry's uh, It's Not Over came out. It seemed like everybody on my MySpace friend list had that as their song. I had Blind Man from Blackstone Cherry. Love that track. Love that band. Uh, met a couple of those guys. And uh, me and my buddy Blake Dees went and saw him at Rick's one night. Yeah, they were with the Cadillac 3. I watched Blackstone Sherry play, and I left. I'm like, Steve, how could you do that? Well, that's who I wanted to see. You know, I had to get home. Number seven, a, a band that we've talked about a few times on this show. Um, seen these guys play at Rocklahoma. Uh, thanks to my buddy Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Rugged or Bongard listener. Uh, it's a tray use, blind, deaf, and dumb. Blind, deaf, maybe I didn't see them. Maybe I saw Trivium, maybe, yeah. Anyway, thanks, Mark, anyway. But a tray use, blind, deaf, and dumb. Uh, this, a tray use is one of those bands, too, where you've got dual vocalists, right? You've got the guy that's kind of the yeller, and the guy that's a singer. In some bands, you have kind of the rapper, and you have the singer. This is one of those bands that employs two vocalists. Uh, blind, deaf, and dumb, a great track. Great track. Kind of in your face a little bit. Uh, number six, if memory serves me correct, I think this was only on the Aerosmith Big, Big Ones Greatest Hits compilation. I think, I think, I may be wrong. It's been a while since I, I dug this one. But it's again, it's Blind Man from Aerosmith. Like a blind man taught me how to see. Yeah. Steven Tyler, always the, uh, the lyricist, right? All right, number five, and uh, this is a bit more top 40, and uh, it's interesting. You know, we'll be uh, making a trip out to Columbia, South Carolina here, and uh, there was a young lady I worked with years ago that uh, knew the guys in Hooting the Blowfish because they went to South Carolina at the same time. So it was a real thing, right? They really were uh, students of South Carolina and, and became uh, really popular there on the club scene. And the next thing you know, uh, Darius Rucker and the guys are everywhere. This is not one of their biggest hits, but it fits our category today. It's I Go Blind from Hootie and the Blowfish. Now, the last four, maybe a little bit of surprise for some of you, and none of these songs are really the same. And one of these songs is a cover song. And, you know, I don't ordinarily do that, but this cover version is so much better than the original, we had to include it. But number four... I don't know if we've done a top 10 of these this band or not. Maybe we have. 
It seems like we have, but we've done so many of these in three years. I don't, I don't know. I guess going on four years now. Yeah. I don't know. But it's uh, culture clubs miss me blind. I know you miss me. I know you miss me. I know you miss me blind. I have no idea what that means. But it was a hit. And it seemed like for a while there, everything Culture Club put out, I think there was a novelty of the fact that, um, you know, Boy George was so uh, eccentric, you know. And I remember thinking people were like asking questions about his sexuality. I'm like, really? R- really? You know, let the guy be who he wants to be. Uh, but the reality of it is, in the uh, mid-'80s, there were a lot of people in America that weren't ready to have that conversation. And now here we are in 2023. We just kind of run right through that. You know, Culture Club was had some hits, man. Everybody knows Karma Chameleon. But uh, Miss Me Blind's a good track, man. It is. But do you really want to hurt me? That's another one. All right, uh, number three. I remember an interesting story. Um, you remember the Sawmill Square Mall in Laurel? I don't know if it still exists. Maybe it does. I don't know. It's been a long time since I've shopped in Jones County. But when I was a student at Jones uh, County Junior College, and we were a junior college then, everybody else had uh, quit and become community colleges, but we at Jones were still JCJC. I was proud to be a Bobcat. And uh, we would go to Laurel a lot, you know, because that's where the clubs were. And uh, when we had money, you know, we would uh, go over to Laurel and we'd go buy CDs at the uh, sound shop uh, there in Laurel. And uh, there was a band I had read about, I want to say in Hit Prater Magazine, it was an up and coming band. And uh, I had to go get it, man. I had to go get it. They didn't even have it in stock, they ordered it for me. And uh, that's back when we had the CD long boxes. Do you remember those? You kids today are like, what in the world are you talking about? It was a CD long box, it was basically the album cover, and it got more elaborate as we went. I kept every one of those, and then when I left home, my stepdad and mom threw them all away. I kept them all, thinking one day, maybe this would be worth something. It would be cool to have. So I kept them all in my closet. I had dozens of these things, including this one. It's every mother's nightmare. Love can make you blind. No truer words have been written or sung, but love can make you blind. Part of the deal. You overlook people's imperfections and perhaps the way they treat you at times because you love them. And sometimes you love them because you love the person you are that, 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 when you're with them, right? But uh, what's interesting about that sound shop, and uh, we went there a lot. And a lot of times, you know, we just want to get out of the dorm and just go walk around the mall because you never knew if there'd be some cute girl out there, you'd go up, strike up a conversation, you know. So malls were very social back then. And uh, I was the first person to have Every Mother's Nightmares album. And then eventually they put it up on one of those uh you know, buy it and try it deals. You try it for, uh, you know, 10 days or whatever. If you don't like it, you can come back and trade it in for something else. Uh, so there was no risk in buying it. And uh, eventually they put it up there. And uh, the rest of the album is just kind of up and down. There's a great track on there, When the Walls Come Down. Amazing. But Love Can Make You Blind, the biggest hit from Every Mother's Nightmare. But there was a really cute girl that worked behind the counter. And uh, Maybe you married her. I don't know. I didn't. I didn't really hit on her. I talked to her. I flirted with her a little bit. Whatever. We never. We never went anywhere, because our music tastes were just too different. And so one day I walk into a Sawmill Square Mall, and the music is terrible. I mean, it's absolutely terrible, absolutely terrible. And so, and of course, this is in the middle of, of the long-haired '80s, man. You know. And so there wasn't a lot of room for college radio acts in mainstream at the time. But this cute little girl that worked at Sawmill Square, she had decided that uh, she would put the CD on because it was her personal preference, right? And we would all do the same thing if we worked in a record store, right? You wouldn't just, you know, the manager would say, hey, you're going to play this because that, that's how it was. Like when, like when Bon Jovi came out, then every record store would, like, that's what they played. They played it in hopes that you would say, dude, this is really good. I'm going to buy this. They'd have a playlist or whatever, and that's back before we could um, you have like sampler CDs ourselves, and so they would just put an album on and have a little sign up now playing this CD, right? Well, she decided of her own volition to put this on there, and I walk up and I said, "Who is this?" And I said it just like that, with that same haughty tone of derision. Who who is this? She goes, "Oh, do you like it?" I said, "Well, who is it?" She goes, "Oh, this is the Sundays." 
Isn't it great? I was like, no, that'd be lined up and shot. The entire record store completely falls apart. Everybody is laughing to the top of their lungs. My best friend at the time was a guy named Alan Eldon. And uh, Alan remembered that day for a long time. It got to be such a big deal. She got so aggravated with me that she turned the CD off and changed it, put something else on. And so I kind of feel bad about that aspect. Though. Even though I was a hero to all of the rockers that day, because we're all flipping through all the CDs, trying to figure out what we need to complete our collection, and we're having to listen to music that we don't like. And nobody, everybody else was just scared to say something. But it hurt her feelings. And uh, I was a little bit of a music snob that day. So, young lady, whoever you are, I'm sure now you're in your 50s. And um, I apologize. I apologize if I made you feel bad about your choice of music. I'm sure it was a long day working in the mall, dealing with a bunch of teenagers hitting on you all day. The least we could allow you to do was listen to your favorite music. And uh, I ruined that for you. So I want to tell you, I'm sorry. And, you know, this is about making amends, right? You at no point in your life have ever... uh, contacted me right or anything like that but I just when I put this thing together I got to thinking about that story and so I'm sure she doesn't remember but I haven't forgotten you know and so now that maybe that I have asked for forgiveness I can move forward with my life but uh, anyway uh, there are some bands that deserve to be lined up and shot though. number two this is one of the ones that, one of the first songs that really got this band rolling it's corn and I, oftentimes I get mistaken for Jonathan Davis by drunk people. There are sometimes I'll walk in uh, you know, places, you know, it's nightclubs or whatever. I go to here to see a show and people are like, hey, I should know that guy. But uh, yeah, it's the Corn Classic, Blind. That's your number two track, Corn's Blind. We need some new material from Corn. We do. Number one, and again, you, you said I, well, you we had a cover song. Yeah, we're going to have a cover song at number one. And we are. Uh, And it's because of the fact that it is so superior to the original. And that we've done some some shows like that, like covers that are better than the original. This is one of the best ones. Um, I still think that all along the Watchtower from Jimi Hendrix, the cover of the Bob Dylan uh, classic might be, might be the best cover song of all time. That's where I would kind of come down. This is certainly in the top five. It's Manfred Mann's cover of Bruce Springsteen's Blinded by the Light. Everybody knows this song, and if you don't, your parents didn't raise you right. It's an amazing song. Now, you go back and listen to the original, and it's just okay. I know there, there's going to be some Springsteen fans that message me and say, Steve, come on. No, you come on. I don't know how anybody could listen to those two renditions back-to-back and pick Bruce Springsteen. I just, I can't. I can't fathom that. Probably the same kind of people that would favor the Sundays over every mother's nightmare, right? It's a much different dynamic. But guys, that Blinded by the Light from Manfred Mann, that is one of the greatest songs of my generation. Not just cover-wise, but when you think about the performance of that song, and they were doing some things production-wise in the studio with a song that was really kind of revolutionary. It is an incredible track. That's your number one song today, Blinded by the Light from Manfred Mann. If you have ideas for the top ten list, reach out let me know. The best way to do that is to do it through Roy, to be quite honest with you, because I get a lot of notifications. That's not a weird flex. I'm not trying to – I'm just trying to say Roy just doesn't have as much social media traffic as me, and that stands to reason. And so Roy has kind of stood in the gap to kind of ensure that we have lines of communication for the top ten list. You can find Roy on Twitter and on Facebook everywhere you know, at Dogmatic67, D-A-W-G-M-A-T-I-C-6-7. And uh, find him on Spotify, and you can uh, follow along and get our list uh, you know, on your playlist. You can uh, just kind of follow along. And I've had a lot of people that say, hey, Steve, I've learned so much about music in this segment of the show. I've found some new favorites, and I've rediscovered some old classics. And uh, one of the coolest things to me, man, is I have all these young people, man, college students at Mississippi State. They'll come up to me and say, hey, man, I love the top ten list. And I'll put it on my Spotify, and I'll listen, and I always hear these great songs. And then I go home, and uh, I play this song for my dad or my mom. And 
they kind of bond over music. Dude, that makes me so happy. I mean, it really, really does. Like, I love the fact, like, sometimes when, when Ian will come through or I'll ride with him and he's putting on a song, I'm like, dude, where'd you hear that? You know? And it makes you happy, right? When one of your kids is like, falls in love with a song or an artist that you love, like from your youth, it's incredible. So I'm so glad we can do that, allow everybody to bond over music. And uh, we didn't always have to be music, though. It, it's been music consistently for the better part of three years. You know, we, one time I did my top ten favorite dinosaurs because we have a, uh, a young guy that uh, on, on his way to school, his parents would play the show. And one day he said, hey, Dad, I'd like to hear Steve's top ten dinosaurs. We did that. We've done top 10 Rob Lowe movies. I had a, a wife that was playing a joke on her husband because uh, when they were first dating, he thought she had a big crush on Rob Lowe. And here's the spoiler, she did. And so she had me do top 10 Rob Lowe movies because she knew her husband was a little bit sensitive. It's kind of an inside joke. It was a fun thing. But if you've got other ideas, we're happy to do that too. We just won't have a playlist, right? Uh, so reach out, let us know. We're happy to do it. And uh, it's amazing what this thing has become. I have so many young people that have come up and said, you know what, this is a good thing, Steve. I appreciate that. And uh, I remember my buddy Jeff Murray hit me up one day, and he's like, I can't believe you did Ronnie James Dio. You know, why would I not, Jeff? You know, right? But where else are you going to get that? How are you going to go from Dio to Culture Club on one show? It's not going to happen. Nobody, nobody but me is doing that stuff. All right, next segment of the show brought to you by Campus Bookmart. I mentioned I was there yesterday. A lot of Mississippi State merch uh, going across the counter between the customer and the cashier at Campus Bookmark. A lot of people outfitting their family Campus Bookmark. You should, too. If you couldn't make it to town, or perhaps it's going to be game day before you can get here, you can support a Starkville business by going to campusbookmart.net. And by being a loyal Boneyard listener, we'll give you a phrase that pays. That's BSR, which stands for Beautiful Steve Robertson. That gets you free shipping on all orders over 75 bucks. Any order less than 75 bones, absolutely incomplete. Mom, let me tell you this. I'm sure Dad's already told you, but maybe he hasn't mentioned it. He wants new Mississippi State merch with that interlocking MSU logo on it. You do, too. The kids do. Take care of that today. I understand there's going to be some uh, jerseys available here in a few weeks. Yeah, how about that? Yeah, right around game time. Come by and get those too. But when you hit the Starkville city limits, you need to already have your interlocking MSU merch on. We should make we should have like the uh, the police and the state the state highway patrol like positioned like at all entry points in the Starkville to double check and make sure you got your stuff on. We we do. So go ahead and avoid that uh, you know, calamity by ordering today at campusbookmart.net. I love them. They love me. They love each of you. A lot of people make claims they've got the most extensive Mississippi State collections. They don't. Campus Bookmart does. All right, let's talk Texas A&M. We're going to play them this year. Wasn't a good year in College Station last year. Wasn't a good year. People were ready to fire Jimbo Fisher, fairly early in the year, they kind of stumbled through a win over Sam Houston State to open the season 31 nothing, And then our friend Kevin Barbet helped lead uh, App State to a 17-14 win. I watched that game recently uh, after some of the false narratives about our offense were out there among the SEC media. Because I was like, you know, I just want to see. You know, how often do they really go under center? Did I miss something? You know, I thought it was more of a pistol and shotgun formation. It is. But I talked to Barbier about that off the record the other day, about that A&M game. And he tells me that the guys at App State, he goes, man, they really get up. There's a culture there that they have a chip on their shoulder. Like, they think they can play with anybody. They relish the opportunity to go play a Power 5 program in their own stadium. If you watch that App State game with A&M, App State should have won that thing going away. It should probably be more like 31 to 14. That's the truth. App State dominated that game and just had trouble finishing some drives. Give A&M a little bit credit, but it was more about App State's time uh, you know, not always being able to be efficient. But they win the game 17-14. The next week, uh, A&M bounces back and beats number 13 Miami 17-9. Miami was a bit of a fraud, as we all knew. Then they beat A&M, beat, excuse me, beat Arkansas in uh, Jerry World, and they're 3-1, and one, think, okay, they've kind of righted the ship a little bit. Arkansas, of course, 10-0. Uh, and 0. They came here. I, I felt then they were a bit of a fraud. They are having trouble scoring points. 
and they did against us too. You know, the big play in that ball game, of course, the um, Emmanuel Forbes blocked field goal that DeCamrion Richardson scooped up and ran back for a uh, scoop and score. State wins 42-24. The next week, you know, of course, at this point, people are right there, there. The pitchforks are out. They go to Alabama and nearly pull it off. But Alabama survives 24-20. And again, not a dominant Alabama team last year, much of the year. But A&M made it interesting. And you know that's a game that Alabama had circled on the schedule after losing in College Station in 21. You know Alabama wanted Jimbo Fisher. They wanted A&M, not just because of the fact they wanted that game of redemption. There had been so much discussion off the field about NIL and about buying players and things like that that uh, there was a grudge match. Alabama wins, but A&M acquitted themselves pretty well. The next week, they go to college, excuse me, go to Columbia, the Williams-Brice Stadium, and they drop that game to South Carolina. I thought A&M would win, but South Carolina gets it done 30-24. to The losing streak then continues uh, at home the next week at Kyle Field. You know, that's when um, they had to play the freshman uh, kid at quarterback. And Ole Miss wins 31-28. It was an interesting game. I still don't think – for some reason, Jimbo just didn't call enough running plays against Ole Miss. I don't know why you'd want to throw it as much as they did. But Connor Wegman acquitted himself pretty well. They just couldn't pull it off. It continues. They go to – they host Florida and get beat 41-24. They lose at Auburn to, a you know, an Auburn team that, uh, you know, with an interim coach, just there wasn't a – there wasn't a lot of reasons for them to lose this ball game. They do 13 to 10. And so in the middle of all of this, when Jimbo is under the gun here, they drop six straight. They bounce back and win an ugly game against UMass 20 to three. And the place was basically empty. They have senior day, a maroon out on senior day, and they upset LSU 38, 23. I remember when all that was happening, we're like, where has this been? They ended up five and seven. The only team in the SEC West to not make a bowl game. But that's the bottom line. They're done. And now you bring in um, Bobby Petrino to be the offensive coordinator. Do you really think that uh, he and Jimbo are going to get along? I don't. I think as soon as they have a little bit of adversity, you're going to start hearing some, uh, some resentment bubble up on the backside of things. But there were a lot of people that thought A&M was going to be really good last year. They weren't. Again, 5-7. and seven. So, you know, what happens? Now, Bobby Petrino is the guy that's always been able to develop quarterbacks. So, I think Connor Wagman will take a step forward this year. And a lot of it's going to boil down to, uh, you know, obviously Devin Achain's not there anymore. But, uh, you know, Nia Smith's a guy that uh, one of my favorite players in the Southeastern Conference. You know, we'll see how it goes. But, um you know, quarterback injuries the last two years have been a real problem. And so Jimbo's got to get that room up and running. You know, they were to talk at one time that Jimbo was a quarterback whisperer. I don't think that that, uh, that label has stuck. But uh, Wegman is a guy, man. Wegman's a guy that makes some things happen. And if you get Anaya Smith rolling, as they should, they should be in pretty good shape. And then uh, Moose Muhammad, of course, uh, huge Evan Stewart, great. You know, so from a skill standpoint, they should be good. Um, you know, but how, what do they do, you know, when you had Devin Achain, one of the most explosive players in all college football, now he's gone. And so they've got some young guys they feel really good about. Of course, there's uh, five-star Frosch, Ruben Owens, will probably be a guy that uh, by the time the year ends that most people in the Southeastern Conference know exceptionally well. You know, I remember Niles Davis at uh, Arkansas when Petrino was there. He's a kid that nearly came to Mississippi State. Went to Arkansas, had a big fumble in that ball game that um, you know kind of turned the tides for us, for sure, in that game. But uh, listen, Petrino knows offense. And it's a good get for them. It really is. Uh, but you know what happens to the offensive line? You know that that's they're kind of a rebuilt group there. You will see. You will see. Now, they do get Bryce Foster back. He missed last year uh, due to a knee injury, but he's back. But they, they need some guys, uh, you know, to take a step, kind of building this thing around Cam Dewberry. We'll see. 
Uh, defensively, you know, this is a group that was pretty good last year. And uh, DJ Durkin, of course, is back. They were not good against the run at all. Not. But McKinley Jackson is there. You know, former top player in Mississippi. Five-star kid out of George County. He'll be the centerpiece of all that. Walter Nolan, of course, is a guy that's, uh, you know, originally from, uh, you know, the Memphis area. Was in the state of Mississippi for a while, then went to prep school. But, uh, you know, listen, they got some dudes out there. Edrin Cooper, of course, a guy that we expected to be a Bulldog. He eventually um, chose A&M and uh, has done some good things out there. But we'll see. I mean, it's just like, you know, the defense at times was pretty good, but when you can't stop the run in this league, it makes for a long year. It really makes for an all, a long year. And uh, Nick Constantino, a, a guy that's been one of the better punters in the country, big-time player, you know, for sure. And he's like, Steve, you know, you're highlighting a punter. Well, yeah, that's because I think they're going to punt a lot. All right, let's take a look at the 2023 schedule. And, again, it'll be interesting to see how this thing kind of comes together this year. Uh, they open up with the University of New Mexico, the alma mater of one, Zach Arnett. That should be a game that A&M should handle. Then they have to go to Miami. They host UL Monroe. And so three non-conference games to begin this late, and you think they should do no worse than two and one. And I don't know how good Miami's going to be this year. Nobody ever seems to know. But um, they're capable of winning that ball game. Then they get Auburn at Kyle Field. I don't know if Hugh Freeze and those guys are going to be ready to go or not. That's a tough environment to go in there to open up the SEC slate. But um, you'd like to think A&M could win that game. Then it's Arkansas in uh, Jerry World again. We talk about not being able to stop the run. Huge test. First part of the schedule. You get Arkansas. Probably will be one of the most grueling and prolific rushing offenses in the conference. I don't think Arkansas is going to have a great year because of their defensive issues. But uh, this game has kind of been a sneaky good game in recent years. And, of course, they always have huge, huge, huge crowds uh, there in Arlington. Kind of meeting halfway. But uh, it's a great environment for college football, and they do a great job there uh, facilitating games. But uh, you got to look at it. It's definitely a toss-up game. I think I'd probably go with Arkansas as we sit here today. I may feel differently come September 29th. The next week, they host Alabama, and they're going to run the football. Then you get Tennessee on the road in Knoxville. You get the bye week, and then South Carolina comes to your place, the return trip. You know, they made those guys, uh, you know, divisional across divisional rivals. Then you've got travel to Ole Miss, and then you host Mississippi State. Uh, the week before you play Abilene Christian and you close out at Tiger Stadium. And so you start working through this. I think a and is actually going to be pretty good this year. I don't think they'll be great. I think they'll do enough to save Jimbo's job, though. So let's just kind of run it down here. They'll beat New Mexico. Let's give them a loss against Miami. That makes them 1-1. One one. They'll beat Louisiana Monroe 2-1. and one. Auburn 3-1. and one. Lose to Arkansas. Makes them Three and two. Lose to Alabama three and three. Got to go to Tennessee. I got to go with the Vols here. Three and four. I think they beat South Carolina four and four. I think they'll beat Ole Miss. Makes them five and four. Uh, the Mississippi State game, that's a toss up game. But that's the one game that I'm expecting us to win that I think we might lose. So on the, let's err on the side of caution here. Give them a dub there. They'll beat Abilene Christian, lose to LSU. So I think they're a seven and five, eight and four type team. And a lot of it, I think, kind of hinges on how they play against us and against South Carolina and Ole Miss. They win two of those three, it's a pretty decent year. Win all three of them, it's a really good year. And then Bobby Petrino is probably hailed as, uh, you know, the, the comeback kid. So, you know, we'll see how that progresses. But I like the A&M team. Uh, I think there are some interesting pieces to work with. But uh, they've got to get better in run defense. And uh, they've got to win some of these toss-up games. But uh, I think Jimbo probably does enough to save his job this year. Now, I may look like an idiot <laughs> later in the year uh, because, you know, this marriage between Petrino and Fisher will be awfully interesting. Will there be a power struggle? 
You know, that's the thing. And that was the, the thing last year. And, and I, don't, I don't think that it was Jimbo's decision to turn the play calling over. I think that was probably mandated to him. And we'll see how things uh, progress. But uh, should be a winning year in Aggie land. And uh, may not be enough to satisfy many people because there are a lot of people in College Station that feel like they should be Alabama with their resources. And that's the thing, too. We get so caught up in money and resources. Like Texas has the highest athletic budget in all of college sports. A&M is second. And you look at their last 10 years, would you trade? I don't know that you would. I don't know that I would. I don't know that they're getting enough return on the investment. Of course, they, they wrote that terrible contract for Jimbo and then extended it. And uh, so they're going to have to pay him a pretty big penny to get him to go away. They have the money, I'm sure. Uh, but the reality of it is, is I think he does enough this year to stay one step ahead of the fire. Then we'll see uh, what happens next year. All right, let's take a little time and talk about this blindside stuff. Um, a lot of people have asked me my reaction. I've shared some comments on the jeanspage.com message board about all this. And the first thing that I'll tell you, I think this is incredibly unfortunate, uh, to be honest with you. I mean, it, it is, no matter how you look at this deal, and it's all played out so publicly, right? I mean, we all have issues within our family at some point, some bigger than others. But the last thing you'd want is to have family trouble played out on social media and then it's been basically a national story for the better part of this week. For those of you that are getting up to speed here, Michael Orr and uh, his legal representation has filed a lawsuit against the Tui family, uh, which kind of breaks a lot of hearts. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, the, um, the first thing I want to say about that, uh, other than the fact that it is unfortunate, is I don't believe for one second that Sean, Lee, and Tui and their family ever expected to be in this position. When they did what they did to uh, help Michael Orr, you'd like to believe they did it for the right reasons. And uh, you want to give people the benefit of the doubt. But they never in a million years thought, you know, hey, this is one day gonna, they're going to make a movie about this and uh, it's going to gross $300 million. Nobody ever expected that. And, and to suggest that they did, I think, is not fair, to be honest with you. Now, did they see Michael Orr as a guy that could help their alma mater play at Ole Miss? Well, yeah, I think they probably did. Did they think he had NFL potential? Well, yeah, I think they probably did. Did they think that they were going to enrich themselves? I don't know that I buy that, to be quite honest with you. I think at the end of the day, they saw this as a chance, hey, this kid's a big-time kid. Uh, maybe we can help him out and then at the same time help Ole Miss out. I think that's probably as far as it goes as far as any type of intentions you look at and say, well, what was their motivation, right? It's like, hey, this is a kid. He's at Briarcrest and uh, has a terrible home situation. We have the resources to help him out here, so let's do that. And, hey, if he happens to go to Ole Miss, that's a cool thing too. I, I really believe, and maybe I'm being naive here, I really believe that's as far as it went. I don't think there was any, hey, well, he's going to be the NFL guy. We'll make money. Sean Tui's a guy that already has money. You know, so I just don't think that was the motivation. I know that's how it's been uh, presented. I just don't know that I agree. Now, that said, if the way this is being reported and there's so much inconsistency in the reporting, it's difficult to know what to believe. If there was a movie made about the life of Michael Orr and he did not share in the proceeds of that, that is wrong. I think we could all agree with that, right? That's wrong. If the people that took him in are the only ones that benefited financially outside of the folks in Hollywood, then that is incorrect, and that needs to be corrected. And uh, there's a lot of things that have been put out there about what they got, when they got it. Uh, I've read several things, and it, it does appear there is some conflict. And, of course, that law work itself out as it works through the, uh, the legal system. I don't know that we ever find out all the details. I, I don't. I don't expect we will. But all that said, uh, there was some things in the beginning that they... So someone... I read a report yesterday where people referenced Leanne Tui's book um, about how she said, you know, they didn't get... Uh, they split the money five ways. And then Sean Tui comes out and says, well, you know, we didn't make any money on the film. And they did make a little bit from what... If, you, if he's to be believed. And, and again, I, I don't know 
the details. So I'm not accusing him of, of, of lying or malfeasance or anything. I'm not accusing him of anything uh, other than the fact that he probably should stop talking. If I was his lawyer, I'd say, Let, let's stop doing this, you know, because the things that he said don't necessarily jive with what Leanne said in her book. And that's the thing um, that really kind of gives me pause in all this, because what Leanne Tui wrote, or her ghostwriter, whoever, said, is they split the money five ways. And then, according to Sean Tui's report, they got half of the share of the author's take and to sell the rights of the book. So is he the fifth or is Michael Orr the fifth? That's where, that's my question in all this. And it also goes to show you too, that there are a lot of people involved in the purchase of, uh, of movie rights that are somewhat predatory. That if somebody could go out and make a movie and make $300 million and then the people involved got $14,000 a piece, that's not a good deal. And that says a lot about uh, the people that represented him in, in, the, in the deal. But the bottom line is, is that Michael Orr deserves to share in the profits. A lot of people would say, hey, well, Steve, hey, here's the deal. You know, uh, Hollywood made that money, not the Tuies. And I don't know what they made. Uh, only they know and their legal representation. That's something obviously will come out, you know, um, over the course of this thing. But, um, again, I, I just... Nobody ever expects that to happen. It's like, hey, okay, what? Okay, they're writing a book. Okay, that's pretty cool. And, and from, if what's been reported is to be believed, uh, the author, uh, Michael Wright, was already connected with Sean Tui. And so I'm sure as a writer myself, hey, this, hey, this is a great story. Let's make a great book. Uh, the Blind Side. And, you know, great title, too. I'm a big fan of two-word titles. It makes perfect sense, right? He's a left tackle. He's a blindside protector. It's beautiful, right? But they're part of the issue with this, and I've never seen the movie, nor will I ever watch the movie. Uh, life is too short. Death is too certain uh, to waste time viewing propaganda, and that's what this is. But based on what I've learned over the years, that what's represented in the movie is the Hollywood version of events. It's not, and Sean and Leon Tui didn't write this script. Uh, they didn't even write the book. Obviously, they were part of that process. But from what I understand, the movie is very different from the book. And even that, at times, is not necessarily exactly what happened. And there are a couple of inconsistencies that I want to point out. And this is not about the Tuies. This is about Hollywood kind of taking a story and kind of crafting it to make it a more marketable story, right? Uh, Michael Orr was a known commodity in recruiting circles. I was a part of things at scout.com. He was the number five offensive tackle in the country after his junior year. And he was an all-state player. He was already at Briarcrest before he met the Tui family. Now, from what I understand, and again, you may have seen the movie. I haven't. So you may know more about this than I do. But from what I've read and what I understand, the, the movie kind of makes it seem like, hey, he was this inner city kid, uh, was homeless out on the streets, and that they took him in and they brought him to Briarcrest. Well, that was already, that in and of itself is false from what I've read, Right. Um, he was already a student there uh, his sophomore year and then kind of emerged as this, uh, you know, true SEC football prospect as a junior. And then after that is when he moved in with the Tuies. Now, again, you can question their motivation all you want to, but that has been misrepresented to a lot of people. And then the whole thing about Leanne Tui slash Sandra Bullock teaching him to play football, uh, that is completely false. It's completely false. You don't get to be an all-state player in a football crazy state like Tennessee and then learn to play football. So, again, I think let's be fair to the Tui family here and say, you know, look, there are some things that have been represented about them through the movie that are just a Hollywood version, kind of a homogenized version of events. Uh, if you read the book, and I have read excerpts from the book, like Hugh Freeze does not come off uh, as a sympathetic character in this story. And, of course, 
Freeze ended up at Ole Miss in an off-the-field position after all of this. And that would be illegal today, right? That, that would be impermissible according to NCAA rules. And so there are a lot of people that say, hey, that was all part of the deal. Now, what's interesting is Michael Orr could have gone to just about any school in the country. And there were schools that didn't offer him that certainly would have if they had the opportunity to sign him and they thought they would get a chance. You know, Phil Fulmer at Tennessee, there were a lot of people expecting him to go to Tennessee. And that's where this conservatorship thing comes up. I don't know the legalities behind that. So I'm not going to sit here and pass judgment on how that was handled because I don't know. And people have kind of built it, well, they adopted him. And again, I, I don't know how that gets into the public vernacular. Of course, we find out now that it was a conservatorship, which uh, is a lot more restrictive, right? And it gives uh, the conservator the ability to oversee finances for their ward. And that's the, really the crux of the lawsuit. They're trying to suggest that that relationship was improper, that they did not handle that correctly. Um, and so a lot of people have said, hey, well, you know, Michael Orr wouldn't be anywhere without the Tui family. That's just incorrect. He'd be exactly where he is today in many respects. That's not to say that they weren't kind to him because they clearly were, right? I mean, that's whether you believe the movie or not, the fact that a family would basically take in a complete stranger, you know, just so happened to play football with their kid, and they goes, you know, he didn't have a good situation. And we've got you know, plenty of room here. We have the financial resources. There aren't many families who would do that. No matter how you feel about them. And if, if you remove the Ole Miss label from this, there are a lot of people who say, you know what, that'd be a good thing. The problem is, and this is the whole thing with Michael Orr and the Tuies, is that so many people look at this and say, you know what, a lot of this was about getting this kid to Ole Miss that that was kind of the motivation. And I don't know if that's true or not. But I know this, he could have gone anywhere in the country without the conservatorship. In order for him to go to Ole Miss, they had to have the conservatorship. And said, but Steve, why is that? Well, the NCAA has a prohibition on this sort of thing. So like, say for an example, you know, you see it all the time with street agents, right? It's like they don't have a pre-existing relationship with prospects that predates their status as a recruit. Once they become a recruitable athlete, all of a sudden you can't have all these uh, friends of the family that show up to help them uh, negotiate their way through the recruitment process, right? And that, that's why that rule was in place, is so you don't have the exploitation of prospects. That's what, that's what that's for. And so in order for him to go to Ole Miss, they had to set up this conservatorship. And that by their own admission, they say that, that to help Michael get to Ole Miss, this is what we had to do. Now, Michael Orr may have just said, you know what, these people have been great to me, and uh, I could go anywhere in the country, but maybe I want to make them happy. Maybe I want to pay them back a little bit and say, you know what, for their kindness, I'm, I'm going to go to Ole Miss and play. It's not that far from home. I mean, the people that took care of me I can come and watch me play. I mean, you know, obviously he is uh, you know, from the greater Memphis area, so it, it wouldn't be a burden on his mom uh, to come see a game or his friends or his coaches or anybody like that. Maybe that's what he thought. Maybe he felt, hey, this is the better situation for me than going to Knoxville or going to Tuscaloosa or going to Fayetteville. Maybe that's what he wanted. I don't know that. I don't think any of us do, but we do know that it was necessary in order to get him to Ole Miss to set up this conservatorship. By their own admission, that's the situation. Now, the rest of the story is, is that uh, the reason there is such a rub on all of this is because of the fact that um, he did go to Ole Miss. When, when given the opportunity, and Ole Miss wasn't playing well in those days, you know, people forget that. They weren't. They weren't playing well at all. So it didn't make a lot of sense outside of perhaps having a personal connection to the two East Ole Miss for him to go to Ole Miss. And a lot of people look at it and say, you know what, this whole thing was a ruse. And then on top of that, and this is where Ole Miss fans, this is where this responsibility is at your feet. We have been beaten up for years with this false narrative about how this whole thing shook out, right? It's like, hey, this is who we are. No, it's, it's who you want to be. It's not necessarily who you are. And now all of a sudden we've gotten to this point where it's like it's blown up in your face and people are calling people out and say the whole thing was false. They didn't really adopt him. 
and there may be some financial malfeasance here. We don't know. That's what the courts will decide. Uh, but yeah, I mean, is is it interesting to see the it blow all the rhetoric blow up in the fans of Ole Miss fans? Well, sure, because they have basically used the movie The Blind Side as a recruiting tool for an entire generation. They're like, hey, this is Ole Miss. This is who we are, and then you find out that the premise of the movie is completely false. Just like when you go back and read the book Meat Market from Bruce Feldman, there's so much in that book that is absolutely false. And so, and then you go back to the Hugh Freeze things. And I know, listen, Hugh, I'm, I've moved on from that. But it's like they have built this foundation on this um, basically, you know, kind of a pillar of sand. And it's like everything that they browbeat us with, there are a lot of questions about the validity of their claims. You know, they would have loved for Hugh Freeze to have been the person they expected him to be. Now, we all have a failing, you know, and again, I would hate for the worst mistakes of my life uh, to be played out as publicly as they were for Hugh Freeze, but I also believe in accountability. And so when you begin to work your way through all of this, you know, the Michael Orr thing, it's like, oh, well, this was such a great story. Then you find out that much of it's not true. You know, the Hugh Freeze thing, you find much of it's not true. The meat market book, you work through it and much of it's not true. And so... It just builds and builds and builds and builds and builds. And so I think the point here, Ole Miss fans, I know many of you are listening, stop. Stop trying to insult everybody else's intelligence. Stop trying to make things more grand than they really are. Because that's where we are. It's these delusions of grandeur. It's like life is not enough, so let's add something to it and hope nobody calls us out on it. And so then when this obviously is one of the biggest things to ever happen to Ole Miss was this blindside movie. And you find out that there's issues in the foundation of the story, major issues. And they're undisputed. That's the thing. Yeah. The big thing now is figuring out, okay, is this young man entitled to compensation? And I'll tell you again, if he was not properly compensated for a story about his life, he has to be. And I don't know where the money comes from. Uh, I, I don't know if it's they just signed a bad deal. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. But I know this, is that he is entitled to compensation from somebody. Whether it be Hollywood, the Tuies, or whoever. I don't know what the Tuies made on it. And if Sean Tuies to be believed, there wasn't a lot of money paid to him, and that's unfortunate. But the reality of it is, if Michael Lohr didn't get a penny off that movie, somebody should be held accountable. They absolutely should be. And uh, all this talk, I'll tell you, you know, I'm, I'm not their lawyer, and uh, I understand they have a very good one, uh, Steve Farise. Uh, if you talk to anybody in the legal community, they'll tell you, if you ever get accused of murder, go hire him. Must be a fantastic lawyer. I, under, I know he's a big old Miss guy, and he's old Miss educated, but I have had many people in the legal community tell me that's the one guy you don't want to deal with because he's going to be ultra-prepared, and he's going to find these, uh, you know, these workarounds. They're going to make you work exceptionally hard as a lawyer. And that's the reason he gets these high-profile cases, right? Uh, but the reality of it is, is the thing that I think about is, you know, I would have them stop talking. Uh, when you go out there publicly and you say, hey, you go on Barstool Sports Radio and say, yeah, well, he's been trying to shake us down for money. Well, that doesn't make you a sympathetic figure, especially when, when the details are getting out that perhaps he was not properly compensated for a movie about his life. And then you're saying, well, he's shaking us down. Uh, If I was a lawyer, I would just say, you know what, we're not going to make any comment. I'll make a statement for you guys and you can sign it and say, basically, Hey, we love Mike. Uh, You know, we want to make sure Mike's treated fairly. And uh, we were unaware that this wasn't the right course of action. And uh, we'll work through this as a family. End of story. Right. But when you get out here and you start getting all defensive, it kind of reminds me of the whole Bjork Freeze thing. You know, like Mike Nemeth that works with us, and I love Mike Nemeth, man. I have so much respect for Mike. When Mike was head of media relations for Mississippi State, if Mike Nemeth issued a press release and says, we will have no further comment, we had no further comment, period. When we got into uh, NCAA probation with Jackie Sherrill, Mike says, we, have, we, we acknowledge there is an investigation. We're cooperating with the NCAA. We'll have no further comment. And we didn't. 
And that's what, you know, the, the Ross Bjork thing, right? It's like, well, we can't wait to tell our story. They couldn't stop telling their story. And the more you talk, the more you put yourself in a box. And that's kind of this whole deal now. It's like, well, what, what should we believe? Was the book correct? Or was Sean Tui correct? Or is there a way that both of them can be correct? I don't know. But I know the more you talk, the more trouble you talk yourself into especially when you're on the downside of the V, when you're the defendant in this thing, you don't need to be out there making a bunch of comments. You don't need to go out there and make and essentially defamatory comments about the plaintiff because all of that will be introduced in the evidence when this thing goes to trial, if it goes to trial. It's like, yeah, well, we love him. He's a part of our family. But all of a sudden, well, he's shaking us down. He made threatening comments, you know, why would you do that? Why would you disparage the plaintiff? Why wouldn't you try to find some type of resolution? And I know, listen, we would all be stung by an allegation like this, right? Especially, and again, you go back to the beginning of this, if you truly believe that their intentions were noble, and I think they probably were. And again, yeah, there's probably some element, hey, maybe he'd be a great rebel, right? And if the shoe was on the other foot, like if all of a sudden some kid, you know, moved into your neighborhood or whatever, and you befriended him, and maybe you took him into your home. Maybe he spends the night with your kids, whatever. So, man, it'd be great for that kid to go to Mississippi State. So let's not paint them, you know, with a brush that we wouldn't apply to ourselves, right? But all of this talking in the media, you know, it's like, let's get our story out there. You know, no, no. I mean, you make one response through your lawyer, and you're done with it. You know, uh, I, I can tell you this, that... Uh, I have never been in a situation quite like this, but there have been times that I have been either a witness to a case or a party to a case. And the reason that you hire a lawyer, and my lawyer is Casey Lott, if you're looking for one, who has been absolutely outstanding to me. We're undefeated, undefeated. A lot of that's because I'm not a litigious person and waste my time on frivolous lawsuits. But all that said, um, I don't talk about those things. And there will come a time when I will. But I don't talk about those things. I, I hired a lawyer to represent me, not just in a court of law, but in a court of public opinion. Because any public statement that you make can be harmful to you. Uh, but at the end of the day, am I upset for Ole Miss fans? After they have browbeat us for the better part of 20 years about this is who we are? I'm not in the least. In the least. But I am such sympathetic to everybody else involved in the case. I mean, again, you know, you'd hate to ever be called into account over something that appeared maybe to be a misunderstanding. Maybe you made the best decision for yourself at the time. And then in hindsight, you look back and say, you know what, maybe that wasn't the right call. I don't know the timing of all of that stuff. You know, maybe the conservatorship was easier to get. Maybe they fully intended to adopt Michael. I don't know. And maybe that was the thought process. It's like, hey, we'll do a conservatorship. And then all of a sudden... You know, he realizes his college potential, and you realize, hey, this guy's going to be a millionaire. He doesn't need us to adopt him. Maybe that's part of the process. And, again, I don't know. I don't want to accuse anybody of anything other than maybe making some foolish comments publicly, right? Uh, but it is an unfortunate situation. But, uh, you know, for you Ole Miss fans out there that have uh, basically utilized this whole thing and tried to suggest to everybody, well, this is – this is how it is or how it was or whatever, and, and you guys are, are scum and we're the, you know, we're the salt of the earth, uh, you know, hey, you reap what you sow, you know. And if you're a kind of person, too, that believes that that movie is, you know, an actual accounting of events, you know, then shame on you, right? Every movie, uh, no matter how well-intended or well-written, there is always some element of liberties taken uh, with book and movie makers, Right. I mean, if they're writing a novel, I mean, I, I, and eventually I've got a novel that I'm going to write that is based on actual events, too. But I'm going to change some things to make it a better story. And it's just like, you know, hey, what, what are your what are your most memorable uh, memories of the movie The Blind Side? And again, I've seen the highlights out there. I haven't seen the movie. Uh, it's like you think about, well, Sandra Bullock out there teaching him how to play football. What well, didn't happen? Well, Sandra Bullock out there confronting a, a drug dealer in the streets of Memphis. Well, it didn't happen. You understand what I'm saying? And that's not to say that that's on the backs of the Tui family. You know, 
there is a movie producer somewhere that said, hey, you know, what if we did this? You know, what hire our main character here, uh, Michael Orr, is a very sympathetic guy, uh, and you've got Leanne Tui, you know, this strong Southern woman, that we're, you know, we're trying to ex- accentuate the differences between the two because it creates a more interesting juxtaposition, right? And so you got to think those people took some liberties with that in their minds to tell a better story. There was a good story there, and they probably did some things to make what they believed to make it a greater story. And there's a reason. I mean, you know, my kids have all seen the movie, not because I bought it for them or I rented it for them. They've watched it, right? They feel a little differently than I do. They just saw it as a good heartwarming story, right? It just happened to be about all Miss at times. But, um, you know, the thing that, that interesting to me is you know, some state people are you know, trying to defend all this and you know, to suggest that he wouldn't be an NFL player without them is just not accurate. <clears throat> and um, I think it's important to understand, too, that, uh, you know, this is not out of left field. You know, he has said many times that he has problems with the movie. And I have had countless people that have told me he's actually a very intelligent guy. And they make him out to be uh, kind of slow-witted and things like that in a movie and that he didn't know football. And those things aren't true. And, again, that may not be something that's on the twoies, right? I mean, again, that's your Hollywood filmmakers that are out there, you know, trying to tell a story that is marketable for people. So uh, the facts of this case eventually will come out, or at least some of them. And so I think it's, you know, again, is it funny to see the Ole Miss people have to eat a little crow? Yeah, it is. But at the end of the day, uh, I think this family did what they thought was the right thing to do. And uh, and maybe, again, in hindsight, maybe they didn't – Maybe. Maybe they didn't fully facilitate everything they should have. And if they didn't, they'll be held accountable for that. Uh, But it is a fascinating story in many respects. And many of you have followed it closely. And uh, I couldn't wait to get home and read the reaction on the message boards. You know, anytime something happens like this, it's a bombshell of a story, right? Uh, But I think it's important, too, let's not go ahead and cast the villain just yet until we know more of the facts. You know, I mean, the court system is going to figure that thing out. But the final thing I'll say about that is if everybody else profited from this movie and Michael or didn't, that has to be corrected, period. All right, let's get ready to get out of here. I've got my bags packed. I got the old change. I got new tires on Ruby. Ruby has a new set of slippers, man. I'm ready to go. I got a couple of errands I got to run, and I'm going to head to Knoxville and uh, spend some time with the wife. And, uh, I, again, I'll take my stuff with me. We'll see what happens. Uh, but I'll get you a show uh, either Friday or Saturday, maybe Saturday night. But uh, you'll get three shows this week. I appreciate your support uh, so much, man. I, it's like I think about those things all the time. It's like I, I joke with people when I meet them. People are like, man, Steve, I love the Boneyard. Uh, I love how you call it like it is, even when I want to hear it the way that, I, that, that you say it. Um, and sometimes I joke, I said, I don't even know if anybody's listening. They keep sending the checks, right? So I know somebody is. But um, listen, I take a lot of pride in the show. I try to do something a little bit different than everybody else. Uh, I'm friends with everybody else that has Mississippi State podcasts. I wish them all the best. I, I, I don't feel the sense of the need to compete. I think the way that the podcasting world has exploded, uh, and, there, and you know, we all do a lot of traveling, and a lot of people aren't music people, so they like to listen to uh, podcasts and get their information that way. And uh, I was on the uh, you know, Mac and uh, Kublik show earlier, the Mac and Cube show with uh, Greg McElroy and hey, Cole Kublik, you know, and I enjoy being able to go do that and be able to kind of represent Mississippi State and be classified as a Mississippi State expert. But, um, you know, we all kind of consume our news in different ways. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a guy that's on the beat. There are a lot of people that do this, you know, reactionary type Mississippi State podcast. I'm sure there's value in that. Uh, but I, I'm in practice most days. Right. I'm at the games, home or away, you know, and so I take a lot of pride in what we do. And uh, I've been doing this for a long time now. And uh, so but I appreciate all of you. I mean, every every meal that I eat, uh, every interlocking MSU merchandising item that I buy, every gallon of gasoline that I put in my car that I'm still paying for uh, comes from all of you. And I'm in, internally grateful for that. And there was a time I couldn't get a job, man. You know, people think, you know, hey, you know, Steve has it so well. I mean, I've worked for every bit of this. But there was a time I couldn't get a job. Nobody would hire me. I had a felony conviction, you know. I'm mean, a guy, you know, not too long out of jail and too long out of drug rehab. And, um, you know, people wouldn't hire me. People wouldn't give me a chance. 
I had to take a job waiting tables. And I had to have a friend vouch for me to get that job. I couldn't get a job. And I look around his house sometimes, and uh, you know, I, I don't say this out of haughtiness, but really, you know, to kind of be grateful to God, man. It's like our first apartment. Dana and I lived on 4th Street, our first apartment. You could fit that apartment in our living room. And, uh, and, and I, I'm a big living room guy. I want the big living room. You know, I got a pool table and foosball table and a ping pong table and video games and all that kind of stuff here. I've got all kind of stuff here in this living room. Um, but I work for this stuff. But I'm, I look around and I laugh about that, too. I mean, we had that little, uh, you know, three-room apartment that had uh, a tiny bedroom. We had a, a living room that, where the kitchen was there, too, right? And then a bathroom. That's all we had. And you could fit that in the living room of this house that we're in. It's way too big for us now that we're empty nesters. But you guys, you guys provided me the ability uh, to pay for all this. You did. I didn't do all this by myself. I work for this. But without you, that work is in vain. And so I appreciate each and every one of you that listen to this show, that buy my books, that you buy Stark Villains gear at StarkVillains.com. And you subscribe to Gene's page. And more importantly, how many people just stop and tell me, hey, Steve, I appreciate all you do. You know, uh, that doesn't cost you anything, but it means everything to me. It really does. Because you are the people that I care about. You are. And I've had opportunities in the past, like when I worked for Fox Sports, I had, you know, people say, hey, well, there's this, this, and this. And, you know, looking back, you know, you said, man, it had been great to have that experience, man. But I had young kids, and I had a wife at home, and uh, I just thought, you know what? I would rather be the Mississippi State guy. That's what I, and that's, you know, that's outside of being a rock star, that's really all I've ever wanted to be, is to be the Mississippi State guy, be the Mississippi writer. I love living in Mississippi. I love being from Mississippi. And I love being a Mississippi State Bulldog. And I know that you guys do too. And so I'm glad that three times a week we can kind of get together. And I can tell you, tell you what I've learned. And you guys keep tuning in and listening. And uh, listen, when you share the boneyard with your friends, you're the best friend that they have. Let's get out of here and go see the wife, right? Until next time, let's all live our lives in a way we make more friends than enemies and people can see a difference in the way we live.